decades now, advancements in the world of engine technology have led to bigger engines. But one of the most exciting areas today involves creating tiny engines that can fit on the tip of your finger. Microtechnology is a fast-growing area of research that has grown out of the miniaturization of electronic components. Some of the same manufacturing techniques are being used to build microtechnology engines. There are actually advantages to making things small. As you miniaturize something, the weight goes down as the, as the third power of the dimension, but the propulsive force goes down as the second power of the dimension. So as it gets smaller, the actual propulsion to weight goes up. Professor Martin Schmidt of MIT has developed a turbojet engine the size of a postage stamp. And why did he want to do that? Well, first, it's awful fun. <laughs> uh, second, uh, there's uh, propulsion applications, um, miniature aircraft, uh, miniature satellites. Professor Schmidt's tiny turbojet engine works exactly like the ones on a Boeing 747. This would be a turbine engine. Uh, where air would come in through the center hole and then uh, fuel would be injected through a variety of these ports located here. And the air and fuel would mix after going across a compressor, enter a uh, combustion volume that's in, the cir in a circular region that surrounds this, and then go across a set of turbine blades and be exhausted out through this port here. And inside of that lamination is this little disc. And that's a disk that will spin at one and a half million RPM. Scientists at MIT believe this engine might power a tiny airplane with a wingspan of about three inches. Hundreds of such inexpensive disposable microjet airplanes could be used for surveillance by the military or for weather exploration. Another application scientists have great hopes for is the use of these tiny engines to generate electricity so they could replace the heavy and less efficient battery packs and things like laptop computers. Some scientists are working on new micro-engine concepts that don't even exist at larger scales. But again, the target device is about shirt button size, and we hope will generate about 50 milliwatts, which is enough to drive uh, your cell phone or a uh, personal organizer. You put a few of these together, you could drive your laptop computer. If we take a fuel air mixture, bring it into the center of a spiral heat exchanger like this, burn the fuel air mixture in the middle, and then as the combustion products go out, use those outgoing products to preheat the fuel air mixture that's coming in, you can actually get combustion under other situations that otherwise the, the flame would extinguish. If we put devices called thermoelectric materials in these walls, we can actually use that to generate electrical power. Some microtechnology engines have gears the size of a grain of pollen and gear teeth the size of a red blood cell. If you want to make a microtechnology engine look big, just put it beside a nanotechnology motor. Nanomachines are so small you can't even see them under a microscope. Nano means a billionth. So things that are a billionth of a meter would be nanometer, which is what is often discussed. Line up ten atoms in a row, and that row will be about one nanometer long. The roots of nanotechnology can be traced all the way back to 1959, when the late scientist Richard Feynman gave a legendary talk at the California Institute of Technology. It was entitled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. If we go down far enough, all of our devices can be mass-produced so that they are absolutely perfect copies of one another. I want to build a billion tiny factories, models of each other, which are manufacturing simultaneously, drilling holes, stamping parts, and so on. The issue was making things smaller and smaller, and that he didn't see any major violations of the basic physical laws, like the laws of thermodynamics, if you made something really small. It is my intention to offer a prize of $1,000 to the first guy who makes an operating electric motor which is only one sixty-fourth inch cubed. The prize was claimed years ago, but Professor Ross Kelly of Boston College wanted to go beyond Feynman's challenge of one sixty-fourth inch cubed. Coming up with a molecule, which is much, much smaller than that, is sort of the ultimate answer to his challenge. And so it's taken us another forty years to get down to the, the, the smallest possible scale. Professor Kelly succeeded in arranging 78 atoms to create a motor that consists of one single custom-built molecule. The original design 
of course much smaller than this, had two parts, something that was going to rotate that looks like a gear, has three blades on it, and something else that was going to function like the pawl on a ratchet. And it was supposed to rotate like this. Each corner represents a carbon atom with a hydrogen atom on it. It's connected to the next corner by a bond between two carbon atoms. The next corner, another bond between two carbon atoms. And because of the laws of chemistry, one can predict how long the distances are going to be and what the geometries are going to be. In other words, even though it's so tiny he can't actually see it, Kelly knows he's created a single molecule whose atoms function like a motor. It took him four years to develop his motor molecule. But now it can be produced in batches. Large batches. Yeah, we had a flask with something like 10 to the 20th, approximately a billion billion molecular motors in it. You could make as many as you want, trillions and trillions and trillions. I think this will have an enormous impact. Being able to manipulate things at the micro and nano level enable us, us to build a nearly limitless number of, of devices and systems, and those devices and systems will have certainly as many applications as the, uh, as the devices we built uh, during the Industrial Revolution.